I wanted to tell the story of uh, Manuel Nevis as a firefighter in the Honolulu Fire Department. I didn't even think I was ever going to be a firefighter. Before I went into recruit school, I never even set foot in a fire station my whole life. I graduated from college in accounting and thought that was going to be my career path. Worked for private industry and found that I couldn't stand sitting in an office all day and uh, you know, I would look forward to going to the bank or going you know, outside the office. So one of my good friends uh, was a lifeguard with Ocean Safety and he told me, you know, I'm going to go take the fireman test. And you know in your career, sometimes you get good days and bad days. So it was one of those bad days. I said, you know what, I'm gonna take them too. So I went ahead, took the entrance written exam. Next thing you know, I'm getting called to come to recruit school and I had to make a decision. I know my, my parents weren't very happy because you know I studied to be an accountant and working towards being a com becoming a CPA. And you know now I'm taking this drastic turn. And so, my mom tried to talk me out of it, I remember. She tried to get some people that she felt I respected to talk to me about it too. But I said, you know, I'm just gonna give it a try. And sure enough, I went into school. I got hired on February 20th, uh, 1979. And actually, that was my birthday. So I got hired on my birthday. So it was easy for me to remember my, my start date. Got in the department, and at that time, we went to recruit school at the fireboat. And we had, I think, like 23 people in our class, which is a pretty good-sized class. It's kind of funny now that I look back. The school ended in April. I started in February. We ended, so we only had recruit schools only a couple months, whereas today, you know, the recruits are lucky. They get eight months of rigorous training, comes out, they come out as certified firefighters. We're back there. We weren't certified at anything. So um, they gave us the best training they could. And then I was assigned, my first assignment was uh, Mauna Loa Fire Station. Uh, so I went on the in, uh, ladder. Then in six months, I switched to the engine. And at that time, they had the program where you, you rotated amongst the, the department to get varied experience. So after um, Mauna Loa, I went to uh, Station 9 or Kaka'ako Station, went on the engine there. And before you know it, I was at Central Fire Station on the engine. And at that point, I felt that I wanted to get stationed closer to home. I was, by then, I had a couple years in as a firefighter. So I went over to Station 12. I got assigned there. And then there was an incident that happened one night, and um, I got called into the office, and they said, well, you got to go transfer to another station. There was an incident there, and they got to separate the folks. And I ended up at Station 10, IAS Station, just like in like one hour period. Pack your bags, you're moving. I'm like, what? So I ended up in IEA, and you know what? That was the best blessing I ever had under the legendary Captain uh, Walter Kumatsubara. We trained, we drilled, went to incidents, but primarily we had to buy all these books, and he made us study for and get prepared for promotion. And lo and behold, within, um, I was eligible for firefighter two and four years, and boom. So I got promoted to uh, rescue. Rescue One in Poa Fire Station uh, next to Dae or in the, was Holiday Mart back then. And that's really where um, I fell in love with the job. Before then, I was still on the fence whether or not I was going to remain as a firefighter or go back to my other life as an accountant. But uh, once I got on the rescue squad, I had found my calling there. It, it gives us the opportunity to be outdoors. You get to hike. You get a helicopter, you do diving, you're in the ocean. And as a rescue man, you really have a connection with people because they're in, you know, people call 911 when they need help, but when they need the rescue squad there, something really, really serious, something tragic is happening. Somebody's missing, somebody is stuck, and there's always a chance that you can still save somebody, you know, when, when the rescue is being called. So some of the highlights, uh, not highlights or lowlights, are things that stick out in my mind. I, I stayed in rescue for um, almost, I think, 12 years, 12, 13 years. I went uh, rescue, rescue man as a rescue firefighter two, then I went to firefighter three, I drove, and at, then I went to captain, all in the same truck. At that time, we allowed guys to just move seats on the truck, so I went from one, one seat to the driver's seat, to the captain's seat, and I stayed captain for about 10 years as a rescue squad. 
And that was really uh, one of the best times in my, my career as being a, a rescue captain. One of the best and sometimes one of the lowest. You know, we had a, a rescue out at Point Panic. Uh, actually, it was a recovery. The surf was really big. The channel had closed out. One of the tour boats couldn't make it. Um, I think they were going in and they ended up right into the surfers and they, one of the surfers got, got injured or got killed by the propeller of the, the tour boat. So we went out and um, searched for that person for uh, a couple of days and then we finally found, we found the person. Um, I don't know if people know, but rescue is always in the Alawai Canal. People have a difficulty navigating the turns out of Waikiki and they ended up in the canal. So I must have been in the canal at least four or five times um, getting cars, rescuing people out of their cars. And even I remember um, Troy Barboza was a police officer that um, got killed and they were looking for the weapon and we searched for days on the bottom of the Holloway um, just looking for the weapon if we could find it. We, we didn't find the weapon. Um, the other big incident that I uh, responded to as a rescue man was um, Sacred Falls. You know, we had a lot of calls at Sacred Falls, but the one that um, we went to, we, we rescued dozens of people. It was a really flash flood situation, and we found two dead bodies. And unfortunately, there was a mother and a baby. So we found the mother, and then we learned that she was holding a baby. So after finding the mother, um, we searched, um, and we, we finally found the baby further downstream. But that was very tragic for the, everybody, including myself. I still carry the pain of that, that picture of having the mother and the baby, and we put them in the same body bag. And I was looking at the picture before we zipped it. I still have that in my mind. But at least we found both victims and the family had closure. We had numerous shark victims that we recovered. The one that really uh, hit me hard was one outside of um, these guys went fishing one night, and um, they, the boat capsized, they got separated. Uh, so one person was unaccounted for. So we searched that night, couldn't find them. The next morning, we put together a helicopter rescue, everybody searching. We got a call from the helicopter that said, hey, they, they found the body. It was way out by Makai Pier down by Makapu. So the body had drifted overnight uh, quite a distance. Um, so we, we all packed everything up started heading down towards the, the location of the body. And um, by then I had dropped one guy off. So the driver of the truck was taking the truck down from Kanoe Bay to Makapu. I had that other guy in the helicopter. So it was just myself and another rescue man in the boat. So as we pulled up to the, the shark victim, the shark was still feeding on the victim. And uh, we managed to scare the shark away, but lo and behold, we didn't know another shark was in the area that I guess didn't have his chance on the body. So he came charging into the body and um, um, he got a hold of the, the person's torso. And I, I had, by then I had the ankle. So there was a tug of war between myself and a tiger shark trying to get the victim, who's gonna get the victim. So finally, the shark let go and I, I managed to get the victim in the boat, but that is uh, very traumatic for, as, for anybody. But just being up close and personal with a tiger shark and that close um, still haunts me till today. So uh, I'm, I'm an avid surfer even in my later years, but I'm terrified of being in the ocean and possibly being another shark victim. One of the big fires uh, we attended as a rescue was the Woolworths fire in, uh, in Waikiki. And that fire lasted a couple of days. And, um, you know, because we were rescued, they thought that maybe we had the ability to go in and try to find the seed of the fire. So we made numerous attempts, what, bottle after bottle, trying to get in, trying to work our way, because by then, by the time we entered, all of the the store stock had fallen and because we were shooting water into the, the windows. So everything was on the ground. It was just a big pile of stuff and we we're just trying to crawl over there. But eventually we, we, we went to different entrances and exits and we finally found the, the source of the fire. And by then it was really small. So um, 
we were able to direct the, the fire guys to come in and put the fire out. But with Prada being able to be a part of finding the origin and we can actually put, a, put an end to that fire. We actually uh, responded to a plane that crashed outside of uh, Ala Moana. And it was, it's still funny in my mind. It wasn't, the, the, the pilot survived, everybody survived, just the plane had crashed. We, we got everybody out. But the, the, the thing that really struck me as being funny is that we, we t tied the plane up and hooked it up to the back of the rescue boat. So we were pulling the plane into Alawai Harbor. So it's kind of a, a sight to see where a boat, and we're all proud, right? Hey, we got, we got the, we were hunting and we found our, our, our prey. But we had a plane being pulled behind our, our rescue boat. I wish I had a picture of it, but um, nobody was able to get a picture. But that stuck in my mind as being really funny where we were, we were pulling a plane behind our boat. But um, more tragically is we responded to a helicopter um, a, a husband and wife coming back from, I think it was Molokai or Lanai, and their, their plane crashed right outside of San Susi Beach. And um, we, were, we got on scene really quick, and the surfers were all, it's here, it's there, and you know, there's a lot of confusion going on. Uh, we happened to find the oil, the oil from the helicopter actually coming to the surface, so we figured it was right there. And sure enough, um, sent the divers down and we were able to recover with the husband and the wife from the helicopter. 1992, March, uh, we had a tragic death. So I was a captain and my engineer who had come into the recruit school with me, uh, Daryl Nam had, had died. So that was very troubling to say the least, but uh, that day was a day that just will never leave me. We were actually, have, we had a film crew with us that week. They'd come from California, and you know that was the beginning of these uh, reality shows, and they wanted to ride along. So the chief allocated. They wrote, they rode along with us um, for a couple of days, but unfortunately, we didn't have any really something that was really interesting in those couple of days. Uh, so it was a, a Saturday, a Friday, I think, and we said, okay, you know, we'll just take this guy out. He was leaving already, um, so we'll just take him out. We're going to go dive outside of. Um, um, Ala Moana by Point Panic, and we'll take the guy on the boat. At least he has a chance to get on the boat and then see us, see us uh, training in action. So we brought him on the boat, and um, we had we had divers diving. It's pretty shallow, maybe 60 feet, and um, so myself and the engineer Daryl Nam, we I was the boatman, and Daryl was my monitor. So his his job was just to to hover over the divers below and just kind of watch out for them. And also escort this guy that came from the mainland. So he was escorting the guy and they were over the divers that were, were below training. And then, um, then Daryl turned to me and said, you know, Cap, it's kind of, it's boring already. Can I, can I go do my own thing? And then I was like, oh. So I said, okay, and that was my mistake. I said, okay. He was the most experienced diver we had, so I said, okay. He said, I'm gonna try free dive. I said, okay, that's fine. I'll stay with the, the, the cameraman. So I just kept the boat closed. I kept the guy in sight, and then um, before you know it, I didn't see Daryl. He didn't pop up. He didn't have a tank. He was just free diving. So I'm looking around and looking around, and then the first thing that hit me was I was, I was angry because he's such a good diver um, that he had a tendency of getting away from us because we would be together, but he thought we were, you know, he wasn't having fun or whatever we're doing, so he wanted to go on his own. So it had happened before where he had separated and I counseled him, I said, Darryl, you gotta stay with us. Like, even though, you know, you could do more, but you gotta stay with us. So that was the first thing, but then when, you know, a minute went by, nobody can hold their breath that long. I said, you know, something is wrong. So. Uh, I gunned the motors, that's a signal for everybody to come up. So all of the, the guys that were diving with tanks came up. We started bringing everybody on board, everybody on board. And then um, one, of the, one of the divers who were coming up, you know, they take, off their, they take off their tank and they're passing it to people on the boat, then you grab it and bring it in. So as one guy passed it, um, the tank slid out of the, the um, the pack, back then we used Hawaiian packs. It was just a piece of aluminum and you, you screw it in. 
And usually that's impossible because you scream right into the tank. It's really tight, can't get it out. But the tank had slipped out. So the guy who was in the water wasn't one of my experienced rescue men. So I said, no, you come on. And then one of my rescue men who were on the boat already, I told him, you go back in. Then he was grumbling, why well, I gotta go back in? They're in the water already. And somehow I said, I don't know, you go back in. Put your tank on and go back in, get the tank. Because I was like looking for Daryl. I mean, things were happening. I said, you go get the tank. So he jumped in and lo and behold, the tank was right on Daryl. The tank had brought us to Daryl. And later on, we found out that that pack was Daryl's pack. So kind of, um, yeah, kind of a interesting occurrence there that his own pack helped us find him. We brought him on board. I mean, that's, try to do CPR on one of your friends on the board. So I had gone on the radio and called that we need um, EMS at, at, the, at the ramp. And I guess, the, you know, you're on the dispatch channel, so the whole department hears it, right? And I guess just from the tone of my voice, everybody knew that. By the time we got to the ramp, which was only a couple of minutes away, I mean, the place was packed with people. The engine ladder from ladder two, they were shopping, they heard, they all, so we had a whole bunch of people there, but um, you know, he's just, he died from um, drowning. So it was a shallow water blackout. So that was like a really um, a blow to me as a captain that you know, everybody goes home and the next day you know, his car is still in the parking lot when we all moved our car out and his car is still there. It was just, it was just horrible, horrible. So that was kind of the time when I kind of lost my edge and I said, you know, I think um, it's time for me to move on and get off the squad. And then and that's when I decided uh, to become a battalion chief or work towards there. But before I could get off <clears throat> the squad, um, another death occurred. So it was an off-duty death, but it was one of my, my firefighter twos, uh, Kalakukea had. Um, by then he had promoted up to captain, but he, you know, as a, when I started as a two, we were twos together. Then as a three, I was a three over him. Then I was a captain and I was his captain. So kind of one of the guys that came up with me in a rescue. So he died, he died off duty and he died in 96. So those two incidents really um, struck home for me. And I said, you know what, I gotta move on. Um, so that's, that's my life as a, a rescue man. From there, after my life on rescue, I, I moved to a couple headquarter um, stations. I moved to Station 38, which was the Battalion 5 headquarters at the time. And briefly before then, um, I had, had also worked at the Sunset Beach, the old Sunset Beach fire station. Um, then I went into the office and worked in ad services and fire prevention. And next thing you know, I got promoted as a battalion chief. So as a chief officer, my first assignment was the FCC. So it's our dispatch center. Uh, once I got onto dispatch, it was at the most critical time at, uh, in dispatch where we were converting from actual um, physical cards, you know, on these trays that we had to spin. If, if the call came in on P Koi Street, then we had to spin this, this tray and look for P, P, P Koi and pull out the card for P Koi and read, okay, P Koi, we would send engine two and ladder two, you know, it'll tell us who the response is for different types of incidents. So we went from that card system to what we have today as a CAS, a computer aided dispatch. So I was a battalion chief when we were making that conversion. And on top of that, the nation was also converting the INFRA system, the National Information or Reporting System. We made all those conversions and um, I was happy that I was a part of it. And then I, I asked the chief if I could try some operations. I was, I was really kind of burnt out with everything we had done down there. So I went out, I went into the field, I went to the 3rd Battalion for a couple of years, and then 5th Battalion a uh, couple of years. And then as a um, battalion chief in the 5th Battalion, you know, it's like, I'm just like a, a project magnet, you know, projects just come to me. So the other thing we did there was we converted to the autom automated vehicle locators. So what now would happen is the, the dispatch will know the locations of the, all the trucks and we could call the closest truck. Before then it was just based on a, 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 a static dispatch where if this is your first in area, you go. 
that we converted to a dynamic dispatch. So I was in charge of that program, uh, project, and we went in and put all these computer hotspots in every station. We installed um, routers inside every fire truck, automatic vehicle locators, and then we also did the, um, the MDTs, the mobile data terminals, putting all of that in. So that was a project that I had spearheaded. Um, and with the help of all the folks in the 5th Battalion, we managed to pull all of that off, getting the department moved to another step in uh, technology and having a better response to the public. So I was happy to be a part of that. Um, the other thing we did was uh, we, we brought in the MCC. So that was something that I worked on, specking the MCC, the, the Mobile Command Center, and then um, bringing it in, making a video on how to operate it. Well, we, we videotaped the, the vendor when he came down and gave us the class. We videotaped that and made a, a video that we left on the truck where if wherever that was going to be assigned, the guys can watch that and get the first-hand information. There's one um, coconut tree or palm tree out at the North Shore. And no matter how many years after, you know, it must have been maybe 20 years but I still remember responding to that tree where a car was uh, impaled into the tree. The, tr the car was actually maybe four feet off the ground. That's how fast this car was going. Ended up uh, right into the tree and we had to extricate the victims at a high level, four feet level, and you know, concerned whether the car was stable enough for us to remove the victim. But five people died at that, that accident. I mean, it was a graduation or a funeral. They were coming back from some family party and um, this horrific um, scene that we had to get the guys out of there. But that's one of the big ones that, that I remember. The other one that um, it's hard to beat is that we had a 42-car 42, 42 pileup on the H1 freeway. And you can imagine, you're the incident commander, and you roll up and you got 42 cars in you know, an accident multiple victims, the thing is spread out for miles and the whole place is shut down. And so uh, that, that one is uh, really stuck in my mind. Um, you know, also one of the other things that I'm proud of to be a part of is that <clears throat> at that time when I was a battalion chief, I was also going to uh, graduate school and I, I wrote a paper on recruiting and retaining women in the fire service. At that time, we only had four women in the Honolulu Fire Department, and the statistics said that they should have at least, you know, one and a half percent women. And you know, so we needed, <clears throat> with a with a department our size, you needed at least 12, 10, 15, 20 women, and we only had four. So we wrote a paper. We started uh, from the paper. We put together a workshop called uh, "Can You Take the Heat?" And "Can You Take the Heat?" was intended for getting women interested in the job as a firefighter and um, finding the places where women work or women hang out like gyms and sports, sports clubs, canoe clubs, trying to see if we could go there and try to get some women um, encouraged to be firefighters because at the time it was like it was male dominated, which it still is now, but um, women never considered being firefighters. So we have a special day, we'll bring the women women in. In fact, we even bring the firefighter women that we have, and then we have a talk story session where they could speak one-on-one -on -one with the, our firefighters. And um, to the credit of the folks that we put that together, the women firefighters that we had at the time, you know, right now we have 21 women. And even that is low, but it's, it's way better than we had four. And I don't think if we made a targeted recruitment, we would have 20-something women right now. So the women have found a place in our departments. We have one that had come in, first woman, now she's retired already, ended up as a battalion chief. But um, I think that's a credit to the guys that uh, helped put that together and that targeted recruitment that now, you know, women find that they have a place here and they can contribute to, to the fire department. So came on um, as a new fire chief in 2013, after a short stint, I left the department. I went to Kauai to be, um, I was lucky to be selected as a fire chief for the Pacific Missile Range facility in Kauai. Did that for a couple of years and had the opportunity to come back to Honolulu, which I was so happy to do. Coming back and being humbled to be selected as the leader of the Honolulu Fire Department and still in my mind, 
one of the best departments in the country, bar none, you know. One of the things that we did, which is the room that we're in now, is renovated the rebuilding facility, renovated the museum, but we never opened the museum. So the museum stayed closed for about six years, five, six years. Completely renovated, but not open to the public. So I was happy within the first couple of years of uh, me being a new chief, we made a, an effort to set a goal in opening the, the museum. So now the museum is at least open to the public uh, one day a month, but uh, took a lot of work, um, commitment from a lot of folks, but now we have the museum open. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very proud of. So a lot of good things that have occurred as, as a fire chief, but you know some of the lows that we had, um, one of the big ones was uh, the death of uh, Cliff Rigsby. You know, one, one of our firefighters, uh, a good friend of, of mine, uh, helped me along throughout my career, but you know, he died in a, um, a rescue watercraft accident. And um, the passing <clears throat> of anybody as a fire chief, you feel uh, directly responsible. So we had Daryl Nam die um, when I was a captain, and then my fellow um, Captain Kalakukea died. Also, I failed to mention, but um, Danny Villaros, I was his battalion chief, and he died off duty as well, but he died on an air ambulance mission, so um, that was really hard for me. And then this one with Cliff Rigsby as a, as a fire chief, now I have one of my firefighters die, so that was a kind of a low. Another big incident that is one of the biggest fires that um, occurred in our, our tenure is the Marco Polo fire where four people died there. But, you know, we had hundreds of firefighters diligently and courageously fighting that fire, putting on bottle after bottle after bottle of air bottle, and just going in, back in again, back in again, and not stopping, no matter how tired they were. When their, their number got called, that team jumped up and they went back in and tried to fight that fire. But the low of that is that we had lost um, four civilians in that fire. The upside was that we ended up passing a sprinkler retrofit for um, high-rise residents. So, you know, you have the, the bad, but in the end, it turned out to be a good thing where now we have the opportunity to make our community a lot safer than it was. And it was took a lot of effort with the mayor at the time, um, uh, Kurt Caldwell, the city council folks that supported it and all of the fire prevention folks that um, did all the research and the education out there in the public to get this law passed, but um, they make gonna make our community a lot safer. So that is a highlight there. Kind of funny, I tell this story, I told it before is that, as I said, I was the fire chief in Kauai. I was fortunate enough to get selected and I had a chance to um, really hone my skills because it was a very small department. It's only one station you know, just a couple, 20 something full-time employees. But, um, you know, the same issues that we have in a big department you have there. But it was, when I, when I terminated, when I quit there to come to Honolulu, had all my things packed, shipped over, and I was on a flight. I was on a flight to Kauai to come here. And, you know, you hear that song, Honolulu City Lights, and I'm flying in a plane and I'm looking at this island and it was dusk and all the lights were on. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be responsible for all this whole island, all these lights, all these people and all the visitors. And they selected me, you know, they had the faith in me that I could do it. And I gotta step up now. And that was, that was really the eye opening when I didn't even land, but I was coming in and having a, that view of Oahu and saying, wow, this is an unreal responsibility, but then it's an opportunity. And I, I felt uh, my whole career I was preparing for this opportunity. And I was fortunate enough for, to God, for God for giving me this opportunity to, to run this department. But that, that, that was just like, I was having an anxiety attack going, oh my God, it's, I'm, you know, I question whether you can do it, are you the right guy, can you really pull this off, and uh, But that was the perspective, is that once you get that, they say, okay, you got selected, then wow, you just gotta step it up. Your game is, you know, 
There's no second chance. This is it. Yeah. Is that yeah. what you wanted for? And now you, it's like, okay, now I got to commit. I, I get that. Final, final question for real. <laughs> when you think about the Honolulu Fire Department, what, what comes to mind for you? What do you think of? I think when, when you say, anybody says, Honolulu Fire Department, to me, and maybe we're biased, but this got to be the best fire department in the world, huh? I mean, if I had to choose, okay, you can work for ABC Fire Department or Honolulu Fire Department. Wow, there's no choice. Man. This is the best department. And, um, you know, it's, it's a tribute to the 33 chiefs that came before me that made our department what it is today. King Kamehameha III having so much forethought starting a fire department in 1851 where there's no other fire departments. The Mississippi, that's a big part of a, no fire departments on the west side of this nation. But we had one in the middle of the ocean and all these people that came before me had the vision, had the forethought uh, to create this department. And look where we come, we've come in, you know, 168 years. We've come so far and um, and that's the other struggle is that main, make, how do we maintain that um, our, our not only status but uh, our ability to, to service the public the way we do. And I'm, I'm, I'm so proud that's, and I'm proud of the fact that I am the chief and I got selected and I'm, I'm really lucky. I think about it every day that I'm, I'm so lucky to be put in this, this spot. And there's not many people that can say they are the fire chief of Honolulu Fire Department, but uh, and I don't want to say I'm biased, but I think there's no other fire department better than ours in the whole country. We, we go Malka to Makai. We can do everything. You look at our chiefs, our captains, our threes, everybody. We put them up against anybody in the country, anybody, bar none. I think we've got the best guys here and the best department. So I'm very happy, and I'm so blessed that I'm in this spot right now.